Welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. We are beginning our deep dive into the design way. Let's see. This is going to be very, very challenging, very, very exciting. Okay. What we have done with 52 Living Ideas meetup, meetups is that we have learned how to really dive deep into a written work. The classic example of that is Tao Te Ching, where we put a poem down and then everybody talks about their translations that they like, then their own interpretations. And we have this incredible dialogue surrounding these 16 lines, which bring out the meaning of those 16 lines like I cannot imagine. No matter how hard I study those lines using multiple translations, the meetup takes it to a new level. This, there is a difference between Tao Te Ching and Design Way. Tao Te Ching is Eastern. It is short, suggestive, metaphorical, poetic work. Design way is Western. It is a complex piece of work and we will have to use our core method of going through the book. And that is everybody gets to talk about their takeaways. You know, we're going to start today. Everybody will have a chance to talk about what they got from the prelude. Okay, so please, you know, first few people are going to speak to get things started, but the whole purpose of that is for everybody to say what they got from it, okay? So that's the first part. Then we are going to go into breakout rooms in small groups so that we can discuss it in great amount of detail. And when we come back, we are going to come back and put on the table the biggest questions we have. Last time I deliberately did not get to answering the questions because I, don't, I did not think that we had enough context to answer the questions. It was more important at that stage to raise the questions. But from now on, we're going to actually try to answer the questions based on whatever we have learned about the book, okay? So what I want to talk about is how to approach this book, how to approach such a complex work using the same thorough method that we have done. So I have come up with a scheme, with a design schema to do that. So let me share my screen. Okay, this is my view of the book. What I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to put in one place in a very simple way, trying to capture the structure of the book. The core idea, and all of this is my integration of it, okay? And I urge you to come up with your integration of it. If this integration of the book as a whole, I'm trying to capture the book as a whole. If this speaks to you, use it. Otherwise, come up with your own way of putting the book together. The core idea that I learned, okay, let, let me step back. I want to say one more thing. We are not studying the book design way. If we try to do that, we are not going to actually succeed. What we are trying to do is to become better designers. Our focus should be on the concept of design and how we understand it and how we use it, because that's the only way you are going to get value from this book. If we studied the book thoroughly, and if your ability to design is no better two years from now than today, then we would have failed. We don't want to do that. It's only by actually improving your design that we can learn from this book, okay? The core idea, that I'm holding in my head is that we are all designing animals. 
to design is to be human. That is the core activity of us as living beings to bring into existence something new that furthers life. What this diagram does is that it captures a core idea. What the book says is that it is by bringing the real, true, and ideal together. That's how you design. It's, it's the most important thing to realize that it is doing an and, just putting these three elements together. And what you're doing is design. We can look at it. This is actually, it may seem very simple, but it is very, very deep idea. So in that sense, I'm saying that this is the core idea around which we can build the entire discussion of the book. Uh, Harold Nelson, uh, who's, who's uh, here listening, um, and firstly, you know, thank you very much, and thank you very much for writing the book more than anything else. Um, and the, the core idea here is that these elements are very fundamental. What is real? I mean, I can, I can look at it in multiple ways. What is real answers the question of what is the world like and your interaction with the world. So in general, it is the area of metaphysics. I'm going to just run through the parallels that I see. I will be talking about in it in greater detail on Thursdays. Okay, so let, let me make a comment about that. So what we are going to do is that we are going to be studying the book chapter by chapter. And on Thursdays, we take a step back and each person will get to talk at length about how they are approaching design. And we are going to use our different format, which is called the deep conversation, where I talk to each person. Each person talks about what they are learning, how they are seeing design, what they are getting from the book, how they are approaching the book. And I will engage them in a conversation and as many people you know, get to spend as much time, maybe about seven, eight minutes talking about their, and we, about their approach, and we will learn from each other how people are approaching the book and what we can learn from each other while learning. So that's going to be on Thursdays. Real is about the world. It's about, it's really metaphysics. True is about methods about knowledge, it's about epistemology. The ideal is about ethics. So it's a com combination of metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics that you need as a base to live. And for human beings to live is to design. So that's what, you know, think of it as a plant. These three are coming in, you're taking in the world. You're taking in all the knowledge. You're mastering all the methods. You are taking in all the ideals. You're formulating your ideals. And all of it is going towards how you design. And you keep redesigning your world, trying to make your life better, the world better, everybody, all your interactions, all, all, everything you touch better. So that is the basic idea. Um, let me put it another way. You can put it in terms of questions. First question is, where are you? What kind of a world is this? What is given? Second question is, how do you do things? Skill, understanding, all the hows. Then is the question about why. Why do this? What is the motivation? What are you trying to gain? And the most important question is, who are you? It's by taking in all these questions, we, we, understand, you know, we answer this. So I'm going to try to go through this quickly. I'm going to do a more detailed version of it on Thursday. This maps onto Aristotle's causes. This is a way of simultaneously applying all the four of Aristotle's causes on anything that you're looking at. Um, 
the best example, best application of Aristotle's causes in the 20th century that I've seen is Marshall McLuhan's ideas of, of tetrad. So he says that, so let, let me just run through that very quickly. Um, he says all tools and design is a tool. All tools extend something. So in this case, what it really extends is, it is this part. By learning skills, learning, com coming up with new technology, we extend our ability. When we do that, when you extend something, it obsolescence something, it changes the world, it displaces what was, thus changing the world. As a result, many times it produces effects that you don't want. He calls it flipping. So he's, the first one is extend, the second one is obsolescence, and the third one is flip. So technology causes all kinds of unintended consequences if you take it too far, when it is not integrated. And what is the thing that provides the stability? It is that, the, the top part. And what that is, is that it's an understanding of nature of things. It is the formal cause of what is the nature of man, what he calls retrieve. So you do things by retrieving. So for example, this book, is retrieving the first tradition. It is bringing back the first tradition, which was in a very integrated form. Integrated, I think that is the key word here. Design is integrated. You're bringing all these things together. And only when they are working together, they produce great new things. That's what makes design possible. Now, this part about Marshall McLuhan and Aristotle's causes, we are covering that in great amount of detail, which is probably going to be the best meetup that we have done. That is going to be this Sunday at 3 p.m. Uh, the title there is called The Lost Cause of how the modern world focuses mostly on the efficient cause of the how and the material cause and ignores the final cause and completely is oblivious of the, the formal cause, or in this case, the human nature. Um, so it's a very profound epistemological work uh, that Mark Stallman from the center, president of the center for the study of digital life is going to do. And that integrates very well with this. Um, I will also be trying to expand, expand on this um, on Thursday, where everybody gets to talk about their take on whatever they have learned so far. This is my take, so I'm going to expand on this. All right, now let's go to the next one. Now, one of the things that really excited me about the prelude, by the way, I, I firstly read the, each person has a different way of reading the book, reading books. I have learned to read books from How to Read a Book <clears throat> by Mortimer Adler which is called syntopical reading. It has all kinds of techniques of quickly scanning through, going back and forth. So I inhaled the whole book in four days. I read the prelude chapter about nine times, okay? Both listening and this, um, because I think it gives you a map of the entire book. And if you get the map right, then we will have some hope of mastering this together. One of the things that really excited me is what Harold Nelson uh, put together is that it's a circle and there are all these chapters and he invites us to go through the circle in any order that makes sense. And because it is all integrated, as you keep learning pieces, they keep coming together and you can put them together in multiple ways. So there is a tremendous amount of flexibility of going through this. The way I think of it, and again, I will discuss this in great amount of detail on Thursday, is that I see the parts in the following way. First is the vision of man as a designing animal. And that is covered in chapter one, uh, not chapter one, sorry, um, the part one and part five. What does it mean to be a designer? 
part one talks about it being the first tradition. And the part five talks about designer in the modern sense. So it's about who. But, so that's the, and, and this is again, a very rough division. Okay, in some sense, every chapter is talking about everything else. But this is a way of, uh, for me to organize what the book is trying to do. So the, in part one and four, uh, one and five, the book is showing, this is what you are like if you master design, if you're doing design well. The chapter four, or the part four, talks about the splendor of design, the evil of design, the standards to achieve design. These are all questions of the ideal of what is, what is ideal design and when does it fail to be? So I'm putting it in that category over there. The workhorse of the book is the part three. It has six chapters. It is the most detailed presentation of the skills of designing. How do you design? In some ways that is, that is the, the workhorse that is going to actually make us design better, but you need all of these, all of these other parts to, to set the context for it. The part two, in some ways, is the most profound because it does something really unusual. And it is very deceptive. I mean, it is deceptively simple. It's just few few concepts. But what what it does, let, let me see if I can put it properly. Harold Nelson is saying that this book is a composition of ideas. It's a composition of thoughts, which take a, taken as a whole are pointing to a way of design. So the key words here is it's a composition of ideas and it has to be taken as a whole in order to understand it. What has happened is that most of the ideas that we use, you have to realize that an idea is also a design. It is a result of a design. Most ideas that we have and use are fragmented. They're not integrated. So what this part two is doing is that it is redefining and formulating new ideas which displace the old ideas. Let me give you two quick examples. One is the idea of ultimate percepts. What it is displacing or obsolescing is the idea of materialism for the sake of materialism, percepts for the sake of percepts without any meaning. And also ideas which are dissociated from percepts. What it is saying is that design is the ultimate percept. You're using all the ideals, all the knowledge that you have in order to transform the real, to make something real, which is the ultimate, in the, which is the best thing that you could make in order to further your life. So in this one concept, it ties all of these things together. Okay. Now, we are going to, so the general, so the general pattern that we are following, going to follow is we are going to go five, four, three, two. Okay. That was my first idea to do the parts backwards. Start with part five, start with part one, obviously, because that kind of, it's actually very similar to part, it is doing the same thing as part five, but in proto form, in the original form. So that also defines, you know, who we are. And because it is historical based, that is where we need to start. So the chapter next Monday is going to be the, the part one. It's a single chapter, the first tradition. So my first idea was to go five, four, three, two. But then I realized that there is something we can do better. We can move through it in a spiral way. So we can do three cycles of five, four, three, two. I'm going to work very hard to figure out which ones to pick. 
the importance of that is that I want to keep emphasizing the integration between these four parts. As a group, we are going through this sequence, but individually, you can go any way you want. Think of this, I'm gonna use, you know, my favorite thinker is Louis Sullivan, who's also an architect. In my favorite book by him, it's called A System of Architectural Ornament. He has this very simple diagram of a seed. And he has this admonitions throughout saying, remember the seed germ. This is, this is the simplest structure. Each of us is going to take in things. Feel free to read in any order that you choose, okay? Read with us the chapters so we can discuss them, but rest of it, keep reading in any order you choose and put things together. There are several things. Firstly, some of you might be very advanced in some of the things and maybe weak in other things. You can choose whether you want to double up on your strengths or to learn something from your weakness. So come up with a plan that works for you. If you prefer, you can read the book through. Um, if you prefer, you can just read with us. If you prefer, you can read in any order you choose, okay? But keep this little diagram in mind so that we can talk to each other about what we are doing. I'm hoping that this will be the integrating mechanism so we'll be able to talk at a very deep level about how we are learning. So that is my take on how, uh, this is what I got from the prelude. Um, and what we're going to do is we are now going to go to Maritza, followed by Joe, followed by Charlie. They will talk about what they got from prelude. By the way, we do not coordinate at all. We just, uh, you know, we just look at this ourselves and choose whatever we want to say. And as soon as this is done, and the whole purpose of doing this is to establish, put something on the ground. There are many people here who know this book much better than we do, okay? We are just trying to learn the book, okay? Please, I invite you after Maritza, Joe, and Charlie are done, please talk about what you got from the prelude. Okay, and to do that, just go ahead and type exclamation mark. It doesn't matter how little you know, it doesn't matter how much you know. Let us try to learn together. Um, what I have found is that our meetup, our way of doing things works very well for people who are learning, but they, it also works even better for people who know the topic really well because they see many people come at the same issues that they've been thinking for a long time from very different perspectives. And they, because of their greater knowledge, they are able to use that, those different perspectives to move forward more than people who have not, don't have that context, all right? So I think this is going to be good for, for everybody regardless of their level of knowledge. All right, let's start with Marissa. Okay, so I am not on that list of experts in any way, shape, or form here. Um, but I'm going to share with you guys my impressions of the book. So I actually read the prelude for the first time after I had already read the um, section on the six core concepts. Just to let you guys know, I am not reading the book in order. I've been hopping around. It lends itself uniquely well. In fact, when I read... Um, in the prelude that we were invited by the authors to read it um, at our at whatever order we wanted, I was delighted because I felt less guilty because that's what I was already doing. Um, so that was great. I was like, ooh, now I have permission. Um, so last week I gave a presentation on a book that is mentioned in the design way and I told the um, everybody who showed up there that the word of the day was uh, intentionality. And when I reread the prelude for the second time, that's the word that jumped out at me, intentionality and integration. 
are the two words that kind of jumped out a lot to me here. And I see threads of that throughout all the other pieces that I've now read in the book. Um, I find that it's so like, it's what we're being told here and the prelude reads to me as kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come. It's kind of a, um, it's almost like a key. Like, I don't know if any of you guys um, are into nature, but there's a whole bunch of nature books out there for trees, plants, birds, and they have a dichotomous key. This prelude reads a little bit like a dichotomous key to me. It's telling you where to go to find what. Um, and the, I, lo I love a couple, there's a couple lines in this short prelude that stand out a lot to me. One of them is, it says, this book is not a scientific treatise or a manifesto. It is a composition of ideas. First, I love that it's letting you know in black and white. We're acknowledging the scientific aspects. We have a deep and abiding respect for the sciences, but that's not why we're here. But then there's this beautiful phrase, composition of ideas. When I went through the core concepts, the, the idea of design and life being a composition, an integration of ideas and of actions is just, to me, it's, it makes life a beautiful poetry is, is what I'm reading here. So I really like that. I think it's gonna come up more than once for us, this idea that it's a composition of ideas. And that's fascinating because what is a composition but a whole conglomerate of smaller parts meshed together to create something far more intense and immense than its small components by themselves. And that's, to me, the idea that I would move forward in life with the intention to make everything that I come across and that I touch, this composition of ideas. It's just, it's kind of amazing. Um, the, another thing in the prelude that really st stand out to me is the, um, it's a, it's talking about, uh, again, you know, we're, we're talking about how um, the world's changing and, and this idea of intention, it's not just called intention, it's, raised with the adjective human. And um, the author's right here, human intention made visible and concrete through the instrumentality of design enables us to create conditions, systems, and artifacts that facilitate the unfolding of human potential through designed evolution in contrast to an evolution based on chance and necessity a highly unpredictable process. Well, isn't that life? That humanizes this entire process to me. If you are human, you can be a designer. This prelude assures us of that and almost goes a step further by saying, newsflash, we'll let you in on a secret. You are a designer, your level of expertise may vary greatly from where your potential is, but that's okay, because we're gonna help you. We're gonna show you how to apply the tools that you already have, which is fascinating because again, when we're thinking idea, let's not forget that that's not a tool that's external to us. That's an internal tool that we can use. And throughout the book, you'll see this parsing of information to show you, it's just a matter of showing you so many things that we already have within ourselves and around us. And the idea here is how do we leverage upon these things that already exist to create an even richer existence and experience? And concept here is, again, that 
which is integrated can become just vaster than its smaller parts. I will say, and I'm, I'm gonna say a little bit on this because I don't wanna digress too much from the prelude, but I am fascinated by so many of the graphs. I mean, if you just even grab your book and just kind of flip through it, your eye will catch something, you'll have to stop and read it. And I've done that several times. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna just tell you guys on page 221, if you have your book that looks like this in this paper, I don't know if the page numbers apply, but figure 14.3 is called centers. And it's, you know, you guys are gonna, it's in the chapter for becoming a designer. But what struck me is that it is a circle with increasing larger circles surrounding it. And then it spirals. It has spiraling lines that come out softly. They would be scary if they were straight and spiked, but they all have a curve to them, like almost like very, very elongated C's. And that's the, the, the name under it says design curriculum. So I had to point that out because it fits the idea that what we're doing is we're looking at things top to bottom and bottom to top with kind of like shreds of, um, I guess, sparks of intuition that are flying out. And so that's just super interesting. And I feel like that that's a really great graph for the idea of how do we grab some of this information and make it our own. This is saying it's a design curriculum. So it's all soft edges with many integrated pieces. And I think that's just lovely. The, um, this, so, you know, she can't said to us that we're not just reading a book. We're learning how to be designers. And I think a tribute though, to this book is that it's very clear that that's the goal that we're hoping to get just from reading these few pages. I think it's maybe 10 pages to the prelude. Just from reading that, you do get this idea that the goal is not for you to you know, wanna pat the authors on the back. The goal is for you yourself to find something or to make a realization even that will change your entire world view. And that going forward, you will approach things with the knowledge and the understanding that everything you touch is something that you are potentially designing. Either you are the chief designer or you are one of the components in someone else's design or some other variation, but everything that we touch is a potential for us to increase our capacity and our breadth of understanding for design. So intentionality and integration, that's the words that I get from this prelude. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Next up is Joe. So I actually had some of the same takeaways that Maritza had, uh, even that one particular quote uh, had really stuck out to me as well. Um, you know, it's basically our thoughts, our ideas, our organizations, our politics, our social networks, our stories, and the world of objects around us essentially are formed by design. And essentially there isn't a place on the planet that hasn't been touched by human design at this particular moment in, in, in time. Um, and you know our imprint uh, is uh, as far as uh, the human design even goes to the solar system. So understanding that, having that as a starting point, uh, the thing that I felt that was really the most important is how are you going to define def design? And uh, in, in there were a number of definitions in the prelude that we could actually uh, speak about. Uh, the first one was the design is a natural and ancient human ability, the first tradition among many traditions 
of human inquiry and action everyone is designing most of the time, whether they are conscious of it or not. So I think that that's a really important point um, is that we all are designers in one way, shape or form, either consciously or subconsciously. And I think that as we become more aware and as we go through the book, we'll become more aware of just what exactly that means. Like how, do, how does design actually fit into our lives and how do we look at some of the, um, how some of the uh, particulars that are outlined in the chapter, how they actually uh, manifest themselves in our everyday life. And then it was, as Mertz had already pointed out, the idea of uh, change and intention, I, I think was a really important point. Uh, you know, the quote that she read, I'll just read it over again, is the one thing that makes this state of affairs tolerable is the inchoate knowledge that desired change can be wrought by human intention, human intention made visible and concrete through the instrumentality of design enables us to create conditions, systems, and artifacts that facilitate the unfolding of human potential through designed evolution in contrast to an evolution based on chance and necessity. And I do think that that is absolutely critical as well, because it, it really kind of is empowering in the sense that it's not about chance, it's about your intention and how do you actually form that intention. And that is wisdom because you're also looking for ideas of right action within that framework. Uh, so I've, I'm really excited about that particular part of the book as well. Um, I've also extracted a, a few implicit and explicit uh, definitions that are worth of design that are noted in the prelude uh, that people can uh, think about. Uh, the first one was design is realized throughout the manifestation and integration of ideal concepts into the real world. Uh, the next one is the design is a compound of rational, of rational ideal and pragmatic inquiry. And design is constituted of, uh, of reflective and critical thinking, productive action and responsible uh, follow through. And finally, the design process, uh, well, actually I went out for this. The process of design is always the most effective and efficient means of getting organizations and individuals to new places. And while that is really just an assessment of design, it can also be seen as a definition of design. Um, and then design is therefore about leadership and it's about culture change and culture. Um, I think that that's perhaps the most important quote uh, in the chapter itself. Uh, so these are some of the initial definitions of design that I'm taking with me. Uh, I too have um, skipped around the book uh, and I'm looking to learn a little bit more uh, in greater detail and really think about how uh, the schemas that work, uh, design schemas versus ontological schemas. I, I think that that's gonna be very important for me personally to distinguish how those two uh, uh, function. Um, I've heard ontological schemas be used um, in ways that uh, are not like philosophers. Uh, it's and, and used for specifically for design. Uh, at places where I work. Um, so I would be interested to see what, how this book matches up with some of the, uh, some of the stuff that we actually do at work. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Barry Smith, if anybody knows of him, but he actually works specifically on building ontologies for design projects. Um, but uh, there's also um, uh, the, uh, ultimate particular I found to be very interesting, very interesting as well. Um, I'm trying to put that into a model that actually uh, works. It wouldn't, it's on a uh, X and Y axis graph now, but I'm trying to actually put it into a model that actually helps uh, kind of with determining where there's some interoperability uh, within uh, financial operations where I work. So that's something as well. Uh, I'm looking to uh, take and extract the definitions that have been used in the book on page. Uh, I I've, I'm trying to think about it. 
uh, 36, I think it is, uh, if I'm, if I remember correctly, no, it's not, it's, um, anyway, I'll put it in, the, oh, it's uh, 31. Okay. And um, so those are some of the things that I'm trying to explore uh, and, and trying to make this kind of pull from what has been given to us and some of the beautiful graphs that have been given to us and make it kind of my own and apply it to a real world problem. Uh, and hopefully at some point I can even share that, so. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, so folks in our meetup, one of the big tools that we have is pen and paper. I think you need to write more than the writer in order to understand a book. Uh, you have to draw. Drawing is very crucial because it is it allows you to see kind of simultaneous you know, relations. So please formulate your own thoughts, both by writing them down and, and drawing. Um, all right, next up is going to be Charlie. Charlie, what did you think of the prelude? Uh, just a second, wait, 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 hold on. Go ahead. Okay, um, uh, actually, uh, I'm gonna be kind of brief, uh, uh, but uh, I have two, okay, for me, this is, not a usual subject, okay? Uh, so uh, like science, I can handle abstract thoughts and, and, and going through theorems and stuff like that, no, no problem. And, uh, and technology like engineering, I can kind of get uh, how things work and everything, but this is like putting everything together at once. And so for me, I'm gonna have to um, uh, uh, have something that I'm working on, a project, actually there's two projects uh, that, um, that where I can, use it uh, to apply it to what I'm doing and learn it by doing it, okay? And, and, and so that's kind of what, uh, just to kind of give you a quick overview. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, a Raleigh keyboard, R-O-L-I, and it, it's used what's called MIDI polyphonic expression. For, so for instance, there's five dimensions. Okay? That's one. You can do the vibrato, and then you can just, you know, and, and so, there's, there's, uh, um, let's see here. Let's see. Anyway, there's, there's basically you can put um, mod, uh, modulation, so to speak, onto every uh, note that you play. Okay, uh, and, and so it's, it's a, it's a new way of thinking about, about music, and, and, but most of the stuff is coming out of, of uh, electronic music. Uh, the instruments they sound electronic. Okay, so my project is to try to find the area in sound space that are sounds that human ears like, okay, that they, you know, like the human voice or like the violin, or, you know, maybe a, 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 the roar of a lion or the sound of wind going through the leaves of a tree. They're all, there's just, you know, infinite number of, well, not infinite, but a very large number of sounds that are pleasing to the human ear. And, uh, and I want to find out where they are, you know, so that, 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 that and then be able to modify them so that a, a performer or a composer can use them to in a, in a composition. So that's one thing. Uh, uh, and it's sufficiently well-defined that I think that, that, that I can probably make some progress on it. Uh, the other one is, is reimagining how the function uh, of the institution, the fourth um, estate uh, of, of, uh, of, of journalism or, or of news, how can that be reimagined? And, and, and so uh, traditionally it has been somebody who's in control of the story spreads the story, okay? So that, that it, it makes it easy for a group or, or a small group of people to have control of the story and, uh, and then use it for propaganda purposes and so on. But most people, they like to know the truth, okay? And so how would you do that? How would you go about setting up a way to transmit information that would be in some sense self-corrective? And, and I'm thinking kind of as an example of Wikipedia where, where there's this, this, this back and forth process of, of, of making corrections. Uh, and it seems like, you know, the major problem is who pays people to go and investigate stuff? That's, that's the hard part, okay? But anyway, that, that's, that's the other problem that I'm um, interested in. How, 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 how could the, the process of, of learning what's going on in the world be put together in a way that, that would be, you know, satisfying for, it, for most people, okay? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charlie. Now, there is one person here who is an invisible panelist, uh, who is, and that is CJ. 
Okay, CJ is the one who got us all started on this. He's the one who has done 25 meetups on it. For each of the meetups, he has run, written these brilliant essays and he's been watching all the videos and giving us detailed comments. So I want to read some part of his comments. He says, um, you know, I, I will highlight uh, some points, some important points I find in the prelude. I think the story told on the story told on pages one and two about design as a tradition of inquiry and action is important and profound. Um, but there are also more points. Uh, our mindscapes, our ideascapes, our organizations, our politics, our social networks, our experiences, our stories, as well as our worlds of objects are all predominantly formed by design. Yes, you can take a vacation and go walking in a world that seem, seemingly is only nature, but even this piece of nature is affected by global warming or the effects of forest chopped down 30 miles away or some small or large alteration by human design. There are no places left on earth unaltered by human design. Not even the moon is unaltered by human design. The imprint of human design is physically all around our solar system. Um, then he goes on to talk about, um, you know, the various definitions and everything. So he's, we, we are getting a lot of feedback and we are going to uh, take some of the brilliant essay, essays he has written on specific parts of the book, uh, specific uh, chapters of the book, and we are going to integrate them into our conversation. All right, so now I'm going to invite everybody who has read the prelude to comment about the prelude. What did you get from the prelude? Go ahead and type exclamation mark to share. Start with Evanik. Uh, give me just a second. Uh, yes, Evanik, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So um, I think the first thing I got is from the beginning of the prelude, which says Genesis is ongoing. As human beings, we are continuously create we continuously create things that help shape the reality and essence of the world as we know it. When we create new things, technologies, organizations, processes, environments, ways of thinking, or systems, we engage in design. So that hooked me right from the beginning because I'm like, well, we've been doing this all along. But I, I, I think what we've talked about as creation is kind of like the chaos and order where we have, this, we have these great big ideas and then we bring order to figure out how to do it. And that in essence is design and on a very basic high level is that we're just creating we're creating a way to bring our imagination into reality, into the real world. I mean, if you look at technology throughout the ages, that's basically what happened. It just came out of someone's mind, Genesis, and then it was like, well, let me make it into a reality. And then going forward um, about, well, on my Kindle's page 18, it's a way to approach reality of the human condition by intentionally embracing the richness of possibilities, the complexity of choices, and the overwhelming challenges of getting it right. In short, a book on how to understand design. And it further down, it just talks about leadership, but I wanted to address this because I think it's embracing the richness of possibilities, you know, I, and, and the word richness of it. So there's so many possibilities that out there you know, you can pick one and embrace it or pick several and put it all in one design. So, and then finally, I don't want to take too, up too much time, but the last part I really wanted to talk about is the process of design. And this is on page 21 in my Kindle. So I don't know if that aligns with the paper book, um, but the process of design is always the most effective and efficient means of getting organizations and individuals to a new place. The design is therefore about leadership and leadership is therefore an essential element of any design culture. Leadership today demands action and the ability to act based on an overwhelming amount of insufficient information within restrictive limits of resources and time. And I would highlight it more, but I think that's key. It's like leadership is not about being perfect. It's about doing the best with what you have, with the information you have, 
and creating something. And I was thinking of that and how that applies to me. Like it applies to every area of my life, my work, my home, uh, my family. Like I can create in general. It's just like, it just brought this new possibility of designing your life or in a sense, creating life or creating the life that you want. And I know people have said that before, but I, I, I think just from the prelude, and I did read a little further, but um, but in the prelude, it just feels like you can create your life and this is the way that you're going to learn how to do it. So I'm excited about the book and you know about learning something new. So those are my takeaways. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Uh, next up is going to be David, followed by Laura. David. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, it's it's interesting to be plowing through this book, but not know where we're going next. So that's kind of cool. Um, so we've been struggling in Philadelphia. You know, some of us have been struggling with how to look at this book. So I started reading it again from the beginning uh, with think my analytic way of dealing with it, which is looking at sort of the scope and definition approach to what are they looking at and what is the definition of this term design or how they look at it. It's a little like what Joe was saying. Um, so I really have it sort of split out in, in a certain way. The design question to me was, is this all about all human being and life, living and thinking, doing, choosing action. And we had the author here and we asked him that explicitly and he said, no, no. But I think that's the author's answer and we're gonna design what we're doing. So that's the wrong answer for us maybe. Maybe we can make this book about a broader scope than the design academic universe or what that can offer the world. This is broader because we're the broader world, right? So I'm challenging uh, as I rescope my uh, notion of the author's claim in the book, it literally says that change can be wrought by human intention. This is, this is going to, um, and my response is, so how much change can be wrought by human intention. We've had a lot of human intention and things are not going that well when you look at you know current uh, results and how much of it really is in our control and how much is our own nature something that's a little out of our design control. So I'm looking at how this whole thing will inform that question and that's where I'll end up too. But so uh, design, they kind of give three ways to look at that the meaning of that term, a goal, at the very beginning of the book, uh, I would say, or what design is the ideal addition to the world, the ability to add additions to the world that are ideal. So it's obviously about action. They make that very clear about action in the real world, the material, physical world, and ideal, meaning our intent fills it, as Maritza said. But they give another sort of explication design might be a little different if it's more than just that it's uh, designing the world to be not just a project on a thing but designing the world to be now it's really an open scope which is more what my question to him was um what what we would like it to be they say so that comes in with the what is not yet which is one of their terms uh and also Design the world where we want it to be means finding our ideals and really parsing our ideals. So I'm interested in what part of the book is going to help us concretize that effort, make that part of conscious designing, how we work through that. Um, and then the third thing they bring in in the definition of design is design culture. They begin talking about design culture. I'm writing this book for design culture. Um, and the ingredients, they say, for the release of the full design, I would throw the word design out, for the full potential and promise of generative human activity. So what are the ingredients? How do we compose a composition and discussion of the full potential of human activity? It's a great, great goal if we can make it that broad, or at least I'm going to keep that sense of it as I read the book and see what it adds to the philosophic view of things that I usually participate in Zoom, which is the world and consciousness. 
you know, the world affects us through sense and our consciousness, and we act on the world through actions. But both of those givings from one side to the other are completely malleable because thought is completely malleable. We can change the way we perceive the world, we can change the way the world is. And this thought malleability of the whole thing is our ability to self-design. So the project is divine, designing the self for me. And what does this add to that model? Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up is going to be Laura. Laura, what did you think of the prelude? Well, David took just most of my idea away. Okay. So I don't have much to say on it, but um, that's, that's fine. I, no, but I have to say the one thing that troubles me in, is that, you know, we design a lot of programs in, in our country with our money. You know, we put a lot of money in things and we design programs. And I don't think we um, do exactly what this model would follow through on. You know, we put the money, we design the program, but what happens after that? is the issue of do we get the right people involved? Do we get people who care about it? Do we get investment in it in the way that's necessary? Do we have the right players to make it work? Not generally all the time. And the real problem is that the one issue that hasn't been dealt here with, with what we design programs, but we need to talk about the sustainability of the programs that we design so that they can we, we can work to correct, and then we can ask the new questions that will, you know, we ask to make it. So those will be the questions that we, to make it grow. And I think that that's kind of missing from what I see when as I, you know, skip through the book. And that's my thing. Thank you, thank you. I, I would rec uh, I would refer you to, uh, you know, part four that has, that is a more kind of elaborate discussion uh, of this. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right, folks. So what we're going to do now, uh, does anybody else want to talk about the prelude? We're just focused on the prelude of what you get from the prelude. I'm going to give another about, yeah. Mike, go ahead. What, what did you get from the prelude? Folks, if you want to talk about this, go ahead and uh, type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, once everybody is talking, uh, is done talking about what they got from the prelude, we are going to go into breakout rooms. The breakout rooms are going to be moderated by people with the stars in their name. Breakout rooms will last for about 20 minutes. So you can get to discuss back and forth about these issues. And then you come back with the biggest question that you have. I'm going to collect all the questions so we can see the map of the questions. I'm going to organize them. And then we are going to take them one by one and everybody gets to do lightning answers to the questions. All right. So it's going to be Mike next. Mike. My interest is in uh, designing collaboration and cooperation on large projects. Now, uh, the book uh, was written by two authors. Um, and yeah, uh, you had a you had so, there was some d thought I'm sure from how the book flows and how that collaboration and cooperation went between the uh, between uh, the Eric and Harold. I uh, also got, had that you got a lot of input from Carnegie Mellon universities and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, uh, was kind of DARPA's center for uh, uh, system design methodology and, uh, uh, and the SDM, which resulted in, uh, in several mill standards on design for collaborative design. So I'd like to, see, I'd like to try to understand, and I see it, bear, I see it um, in that book on how to coordinate uh, a large project like uh, like uh, the Boeing 757 or the World Trade Center or even the design of a book or um, or nutrition for a large hospital uh, and get all those things uh, uh, mined out of uh, this wonderful work that we're about to embark on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is going to be Brian, followed by Jeff. Brian, what did you get from the prelude? So I'm, I'll just, I said before last time, but I'll say again, I'm excited about this book because I think it's bringing a whole new dimension. My sense is uh, 
you know, to simplify a whole new dimension to our meetups. And that is something I've really been hungering for. It's a discussion on collaboration, cooperation uh, as regards the future. Uh, a lot of the psychologists and philosophers from the West seem to be focusing on individuals, understanding the individual. And now I, I feel like we're broadening or even shifting the inquiry uh, to teams, to groups, and the future. In that regard, I'll give a shout out to Jeff Nugent, who is, uh, has been doing a, who's in this group tonight and uh, is very versed in general management uh, theories. And that also touches very closely on all of these topics. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, and speaking of Jeff, Jeff, you're next. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, you know, everybody has all, a number of people have already spoken to this, but um, the the I think that the passages themselves actually are are very eloquent about this this subject. Um, that the the idea of design um, can and and should be applied to an individual designing their own life and uh, design your life, you know, is, is a, a very, um, you know, is a popular concept and, and book. And sometimes the idea of um, designing for others is a significant, you know, for the sake of, you know, designing something for other people, some desire, something that you achieve to give to them in your service to them. Um, but I'm very intrigued by this line from the book that our ultimate desire is to encourage and promote a design culture. And I think that a design culture is, um, extends this to not, to, to not only designing for me and not, not only me designing for others, but it extends to what Brian was saying there uh, and, and Mike was saying before him, our desire uh, to design with each other. And I think that that's a very rich subject and um, it does have an impact on leadership. It does have an impact on how human beings and our own culture and environment and ecosystems are quickly evolving. Um, and I look forward to that conversation. I think that, that the significance of what does it mean to design with each other and establish and promote a design culture is, um, is a very rich orientation. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. All right, folks, so now we're going to go into the breakout rooms. Breakout rooms will last for 20 minutes. The rules in the breakout rooms are very simple. Keep on topic. We're talking about the prelude and the overview of the entire book. Number two, be brief. And number three, speak your mind, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. Starting the breakout rooms now, we'll be back in 20 minutes and come back with the best question that you have. All right, folks, welcome back folks, welcome back. All right, so it is now time for questions. So go ahead and put your best question on the table. In order to ask a question, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Only questions now, okay? Only questions. Um, go ahead and either you can raise your hand in Zoom or type an exclamation mark in chat. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to collect all the questions, organize them, so that we can see the map of the questions. And Joe, if you could keep, uh, you know, keep questions, keep track of questions. The list of questions that you sent me last time was just brilliant. So if you could do that, I will do that too. So we will uh, take all the questions and put them up back on the meetup page. So in addition to answering them now, we will have those questions as a part of the YouTube videos, as well as, um, as well as the meetup pages. We won't be identifying people uh, in the question. So feel free to ask any question. 
Um, all right, so we're going to start with, uh, give me just a second. Okay, we're going to start with James, followed by Jyoti, Joe, and Charlie. James, what's your question? Uh, James, you need to unmute. Thank you. My question has to do with what cultural design techniques can we use to motivate people to reduce uh, carbon emissions and help help solve the climate change problem? Okay, very good, very good, good, good question. We'll probably not be able to do it uh, this time. We're trying to keep it on the general theme uh, of a lecture at a given time, but we'll we'll put that. I'll put that at the end. Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti, Joe, Charlie, David, and Ambika. Jyoti. Yeah, okay. So uh, in a mul mul uh, melting pot society that we are living in, if each and every person of a different culture is designing a life of its own and has a difference of opinion in the truth, my truth could be different than your truth. Yet I'm trying to collaborate with the society. So how is that going to be possible? Wonderful. When everybody has a different wavelength. Excellent. How is collaboration possible when people have widely different values? Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, next up is going to be Joe followed by Charlie. Joe, what's your question? Uh, my question is, there's the design process, and we talked about this a little bit in our breakout room, the design process when you're solving a problem, but there's also the design process when you're being creative. How do they differ? Okay, what is the design process of solving a problem versus being creative? Very good. Uh, next up is going to be Charlie. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, uh, basically my question is, uh, in order to do any kind of a design, you have to do your homework. In other words, you have to find out the real, what aspects of reality impinge upon your possible design. And uh, basically my question is, how do you know which aspects of reality you should be looking at? And how do you know that you've gone far enough to be able to do the design in the way that you hope to do in terms of your ideal? Uh, it's, um, it's kind of a balancing act in terms of, you know, uh, of the available resources, I guess you put it. Thank you. So how do you know which aspects of reality you should be looking at? And when, how do you know that you have looked at enough things to enough level of resolution? Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be David, followed by Ambika, Christian, Mark, and Brian. David. Yeah, um, this may be a, an ill-formed question, but it's a little bit, it's motivated by what James was talking about, which was, came up in our conversation, our breakout. Um, when, you're, when we look at world-sized problems, we have to find ways to pursue change. So these wicked world-sized problems, what, how do we set our hopeful range of action? Um, is there something in this book that will help us I mean, we must act anyway, but uh, you know, try to examine the parameters of that kind of real world sort of problem. How does this book help us do that? Excellent. Uh, it's um, okay. Uh, so, so the question I'm going to put it is, how do you set goals to solve world size problems? I like the world size problem mm -hmm. um, formulation. Uh, next up is going to be Ambika followed by Christian. Ambika. Uh, Amika, you need to unmute. Thanks for reminding me about the design of unmute. Um, so I'm going to combine what my, the people in my group talked about. So I'm going to read my question. Mm -hmm. If design is collaborative, how can values be interpreted in the physical aspect of design? And two, how do you deal with power structures and those conflicts that can take over the beauty of a cultural mythos and create instead sterile environments, which also stunt some human interactions. And the example somebody gave was of the same mall in every city, in every town that takes away the natural flavor. And my focus was the city of Pushkar. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to put it as how do you counter uh, the power structures to achieve good design? Something like that. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Christian, followed by Mark and Brian. Christian. Hi. Um, so I thought of this because of the breakout room that I was in. Um, so I I'm in a large business company or well, a large company. And I was thinking um, there's usually a lot of tight deadlines. And um, with the design way, I saw that there were so many ways that they look into um, designing things. And how do you like, how do you design something while looking at all the different factors in a global um, economy? And then also, keeping in mind all of the different things that uh, the design way uh, brought up in the prelude. That's, yeah. Wonderful. So, so you're asking one part, of, one part of the question is about how do you design given that we are, you know, we are operating within complex organizations in a complex world. That's one part. And second is how do you use all the ideas that are there in design way? Those two questions. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And under a tight deadline. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, very good. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mark, followed by Brian. Mark. So um, I, I, I'm probably going to reiterate some, of, some, uh, some stuff that David said and Ambika said, um, but I still would like to focus a little bit more on, on the, the aspect of change. When design is looked upon, you call upon historical um, uh, landmarks. You, you, talk, you, you look, you consider various things, and you try to plan for the future. But it's a very resource-intensive um, situation to to design properly. How do you design for change so that change can take into account moving in ways that are unpredictable Wonderful. and not? They don't become the uh, statues that 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 are the gods that 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 will just be shown in reverence while they're still outdated. Wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, how do you design for change? I, I love that. Um, excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Brian, and then we I'm going to organize all the questions, and I'm going to put the questions for all of you folks, and everybody gets to. Answer the questions. It's a lightning round, so keep your answers short. All right, uh, so we can get through as many questions as possible um, and as many answers to each questions as possible. Okay, realize that this is an iterative process. Let's do the best we can. And both the questions and the answers are going to inspire everybody to do more thinking about, about, these, about design. All right, so it's going to be Brian. Brian, what's your question? So I have a, a relatively short and then a very short statement of my question. Based on the prelude, how does the design way compare to the hero's quest outlined by Jordan Peterson? The very short question, how do designers differ from heroes? Okay, are designers heroes? I'm gonna put it like that. Uh, Okay, very good. 